Mark Capel has one of the most inspirational redemption stories in baseball. The former first overall pick for the Astros back in 2013 was once called the biggest bust in MLB draft history. But through lots of trials and tribulations, Mark proved the doubters wrong and made his dream of pitching in the majors a reality. And I had the opportunity to speak with him in this episode of Indie yeah, Sports. Yeah, yeah. Hold up. Welcome back into Iggy Sports Talk. I'm your host, Jiggy Nizuski, or Iggy for short. And if you're a baseball fan listening to this episode, I hope that you've been enjoying the MLB postseason so far as much as I have. I don't know about you, it's been so much fun to see the atmospheres of these stadiums, to see the emotions of these players, and also to see all these different teams proving the doubters wrong. I don't know about you. I did not expect the Arizona Diamondbacks to sweep the Dodgers and get into the NLCS. But those are some of the fun storylines and the fun parts about MLB playoffs. But in this episode, I had the opportunity to speak with a current MLB player named Mark Appel, who's currently with the Philadelphia Phillies organization, but has been out over the last few months with an injury. But he is one of the most inspirational redemption stories in baseball. He was a former first overall pick for the Houston Astros back in 2013, and he was once called the biggest bust in MLB history. He had lots of trials and tribulations throughout his first few years of professional baseball and actually ended up retiring just a few years ago due to losing the love of the game and really trying to find his identity outside of baseball. But after finding his love again, he went back into professional baseball and found a way to prove those doubters wrong who called him a bust and make his dream a reality of playing in the majors and pitched for the Phillies and made his debut this past year. But I had the opportunity to speak with Mark in this episode to talk to him a little bit about what he learned about himself going through those experiences of having those high expectations as a number one overall pick, and especially right when the Astros started their rebuild process. And he was kind of looked at the player that was going to help this team get over the hump and ultimately win championships like we've seen them do over the last few years or so. But Mark also spoke about how he found his identity outside of baseball and how he learned how to not allow the media to dictate how he feels about himself. But without further ado, let's get into my conversation with Mark Appel. I am here with Phillies pitcher and former first overall pick, Mark Appel. So how are we doing today, Mark? I'm doing well, Jake. How are you? I'm doing great, man. Just just enjoying the summer, doing my best to just soak in the sun as much as I can. Uh, I, I So I live in New Hampshire, so you know when it snows outside, especially in the winter, got to take advantage of the nice weather. Yeah, what, what what's the temperature there right now? It's around like 80 degrees or so. So it's oh, not man. bad at all. But like, I mean, it's it's so humid. Yeah, I'm I'm down in Houston. So it's I mean, it's like 95 with 100 percent humidity. You start sweating as soon as you step outside. So I'm I'm a little jealous of uh, that climate up there. Yeah, I mean, I, I saw it's like snowed a little bit in Houston, right? It was it, they've been having oh. some crazy weather. Yeah, it's like every couple of years we'll get something and then the whole world shuts down down here. We don't know how to drive or <laughs> just everyone stays inside. Um, so, but yeah. That's yeah. funny. Well, you know, talking about Houston, you know, I, I, I wanted to first start off, you you know, because I bet when, when you know, if, if you Google yourself or just just see yourself around, you know, probably one of the first pictures that you see is that introductory, you know, post-draft press conference of, you know, you with the jersey putting on the Astros hat. And, and I'm yeah. curious, you know, looking back, you know, 10 some odd years now, what what do you really see or what first comes to mind when you see that picture? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it, it, in some ways, it's like I've had friends send me pictures of, who I was in college and all that stuff. And I'm like, you recognize this guy? I'm like, yeah, but also I'm just so different, you know, than, than the guy I was back then. Um, you know, I, I think I remember uh, just some of the, I mean, a lot of the excitement around being drafted and especially I'm from Houston. It's my hometown team. Um, you know, I, I grew up going to Astros games um, when I was, you know, playing little league baseball here. Um, and, and yeah, so that, I mean, all of, all of those things, all those emotions were, can kind of be summed up in that one day where I get to, you know, put that Jersey on, I'm officially part of the Astros organization and just like the hopes and the dreams and the, 
the, you know, we're in the middle of a, of a rebuild, um, which, you know, the city's frustrated about the losing, but excited about the future and like me getting to be a part of that. And, you know, the hometown, like, I think I was in a spot where I was just like, man, life is working out phenomenally. And like, this is a really exciting moment for, for myself, for my family. Um, and I, I, I was just really, I felt really lucky. I felt really blessed. Um, you know, I, I was, yeah, I was, I was ready. I was ready to get to work, ready to kind of be a part of this rebuild that the Astros were, you know, were attempting. So. I, I bet though, that there's probably a little bit of sense you, when, when you look into, you know, that past self's eyes, you're probably thinking, wow, I was so naive or man, I, I bet he doesn't realize what, what, what the journey is going to look like, you know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty, And so you, you look back and you're like, you know, I, I think I was, a, I was a good kid back then. Like I worked hard. Um, I was respectful. I, I, I cared a lot about people. Um, a lot of those things are the same about who I am, you know, it's just, uh, you know, having a more holistic view of what life is like, what the world is like now versus back then, you know, it's, um, uh, there were a lot of things that I went through that I, I think I wasn't prepared for just the the pressure and the expectation of, of a lot of what I dealt with, um, both internally and externally, um, you know, just completely, you know, for most of my life, like I'm just a normal kid. And then all of a sudden everyone cares about, you know, at least in a, in a very small niche of the world, it's like, there's, there's a significant amount of people that care about every word I say in action that I do for a while, you know, and, and I, I just wasn't prepared for that. And I, you know, I, I have a lot of thoughts about that. I don't know if humans are meant to handle that kind of, um, you know, just circumstance being under the microscope, um, right. you know, just having so much focus on you. Um, you know, there's been a lot of people that have handled it really well and, and other people that haven't handled it well at all. Um, but I, I don't know if that's, you know, what, what the natural way of life was ever supposed to be. And so I, I just don't think I was like fully prepared for that. And I, I loved playing baseball and I just wanted to play baseball and have fun and try to win games and try to be better. Um, and then there was all this other stuff that was kind of thrown in. Right. And, you know, I, I agree with you on that. Like I, I'm obviously a big baseball, big sports fan, but I, I also, you know, talk about, it. I I've, I've talked to enough players where I, where I understand the human side and, uh, you know, I most recently talked to Marcelo Meyer, who was you know drafted fourth overall in 2020. And I, I think especially the pressure and expectation that is put on whether the amount of money that you get in free agency or, you know, how highly you're drafted, you know, it gives people this sense of the feeling like they're free to just tell you how they feel. And because yeah. you're put up on this pedal stool and there's this expectation of you that they're allowed to hold you to that standard. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's interesting. I mean, everyone talks about, uh, well, it's like, Oh, well they signed for this amount of money or they chose to be in this industry. It just comes with the territory, you know? And I like, I, I understand that, um, you know, from a fan's perspective, it's like, Hey, people are paying their, their hard earned money. Like they're whatever is coming in from their job, they're actually spending that to go, and support a team, support uh, uh, a sport, support players that are doing this for a living. And that's kind of how they make, make their money, you know, and, and, and not only that, but it's the emotional investment too. And so there's, there just becomes this like level in which, uh, man, it's, it's entertainment. And, mm -hmm. and as if we're watching a movie and we can have opinions about the characters of the, of, of these stories being told in Hollywood, you know, we have opinions about the players um, and kind of what's happening throughout the season. And, um, and the, the more you can disassociate, like from a player's perspective, the more you can disassociate their opinions about how you're playing or what you're doing when it comes to baseball um, with who you are and their opinion about who you are as a person, like the better off you're going to be um, because um, yeah, it was, it was hard. Like I, I've, I experienced that the first time when I went through the draft and after my junior year at Stanford, I got drafted by the pirates in the first round and I decided to go back to school my, for my senior year. And a lot of people online uh, from Pittsburgh um, were very upset about that. Um, and I understand, 
you know, where they're coming from. Um, but when, when you start saying all these things about who I am, my character, um, based on one decision, when you've never even met me, you never talked to me, you've never gotten even to know me at all. It's just Mark was drafted and Mark went back to school. You know, that's all they know. And, and not only that, but it's like the public information, Mark was offered a lot of money and turned that down. So what does that say about Mark? It means that Mark is greedy. Mark is, you know, full of himself. Mark is all about himself and all this stuff, um, you know, and, and I get how you get to that conclusion, but it, it's the wrong conclusion. Um, and there's way more nuance and, and no one wants, wants to deal with that. And so that was the first time that I really experienced uh, just the dark side of being, you know, in the public. And I'm not even a big public figure. I'm, I'm just like, a, I'm just a baseball player, you know, and, and when the draft comes around, there's excitement around the draft and that's what baseball focuses on for a little bit, but it's like, um, you know, and, and kind of the small corners of the world, um, you know, people care deeply about these things and, and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll make their opinions known. And, you know, that's one thing that frustrates me about not only, you know, sports media and, and sort of the, the clickbait media that sometimes comes out is is the assumption that, you know, fans can take from that, especially the people who are behind the microphones or are behind, uh, you know, the computers, really putting out this information for the fans, just trying to help those players and give them a voice. I think I think that's the biggest thing and, and not allow the assumptions to really uh, make a story in and of itself. And, you know, I, I yeah. hate the labels, too, that comes with, you know, the 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 pressure of being a top top prospect or a, a top draft pick. And, you know, I know you've heard this plenty of times, you know, the word bust. And I, I feel like it's tough, especially when you're young, to not allow that to creep into your negative self-talk. And I'm curious yeah. for you, you know, I've, I've heard in past interviews, you really try and, you know, look at everything in a positive outlook. And so for you, how do you not allow that negative self-talk to creep in and how do you, you know, spin it in a positive way? Uh, you know, I, I think in, in some ways you have to be realistic. You have to own like what you have to, you have to own your your shortcomings. You have to own the areas in which you, you know, you, maybe there's an expectation and you didn't meet that expectation. It's like, if you, if you keep fighting to say, no, you know what, I, I have met that expectation or trying to convince yourself of, of something that's just not true, then like, you're going to have, you're going to kind of be stuck in that spot. And so what I, what I did is like, Hey, if you want to call me a bus, like I get it. I haven't lived up to what the expectation was when I was first drafted, but that's okay. The story doesn't have to end there. You know, it's like, I can, I can be fine with being called a bust and I can also be fine with making my major league debut, you know, at, <laughs> at 30 years old and, and, you know, way later than anyone ever thought. And, you know, at the time when I made it last, last summer was, you know, when I was like, man, I'm, I'm actually, I, I had years where I never thought this would happen. So it's like, it was, it was a blessing. And somehow over those 10 years, like there was this shift of perspective and um, where the expectation went from, yeah, I'm going to be a quick to the big leagues kind of guy to, I don't know if I'll ever play in the big leagues ever, you know? And, and so when it did happen, it was like, I was in that second mindset and I just got to enjoy it. And I got to be so thankful for it, you know? Um, and I think we miss a lot uh, when we, when we put this overwhelming level of pressure and expectation on ourselves, it's like, when we reach that level, you know, say we reach these expectations, like we don't actually get to enjoy it because that that's just become the status quo. You're like, you're doing something extraordinary. You're, 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 you're doing something that, you know, people would dream of doing and you don't even get to enjoy it. Like, that's a really sad thing, you know? And, and I think about that a lot for, um, for, for young kids who, are dealing with kind of the pressure and the expectation um, and just, you know, my encouragement to them is just to try to, you know, tune that out a little bit and be grateful for what you get to do every day, you know, and, and just try to enjoy it because like you can't control, you can't control every outcome. You can't control exactly how your career is going to go. You can't control whether you get hurt or not. You know, what you can control is how you respond, how you bounce back. Um, how you kind of deal with whatever comes to you each and every day. 
I think that's great advice because, you know, even in your post-game interview after your uh, debut uh, with the Phillies, you know, you mentioned I, I really tried to like look around and take in the moment because yeah. I, I didn't know if this was going to be the last time I, I would be here. And I, I feel like you can you can take that in any aspect of life, of, of just being where your feet are, enjoying the people that you're with, enjoying the moment. So then, you know, you don't regret later down the line that you maybe took it for advantage. Yeah, yeah. I it, we we go through so many moments in our lives and we just miss it, um, you know, and, and that's, that's something I think about a lot. It's just learning uh, how to be present in the moment that you're in, really soaking up everything that it has to offer. Um, and then also figuring out which moments are worth being present in. You don't need to be present in every moment. There's a lot of moments that, you know, you're sitting on the couch watching Netflix and just tuning out, like escaping from the anxieties of life. Like, you don't need to really be present in that moment. There's not, there's not much that it's going to, you know, you might not be changed by <laughs> whatever you're watching. Um, but you know, that conversation, you know, when you grab coffee with a friend or you talk to an old coach um, and you're just catching up or um, you, you meet someone that might have something, something to offer you, like some bit of wisdom. It's like, you can miss those moments when you don't show up. You, you, maybe you're there physically, and even you might be saying, you know, yeah, yeah, I'm listening, all this stuff. But it's like, if you aren't absorbing that, um, it, it, you know, you, you miss the opportunity for that moment to leave an impact on you and, and hopefully make you a better person, make you more the person that you want to be and that, you know, God's kind of shaping you into. And I think when I made my debut, it's like, I didn't want to miss that moment, you know? And so I, I soaked in every bit of it um, as best as I could. And um you know, thank goodness uh, they didn't do the pitch clock because I'm, I probably would have had some violations because <laughs> I was just enjoying <laughs> it so much and just like soaking it up. Um, but yeah, I, it was it was special. I was gonna say I know Drew Maggi had had to like deal with that a little bit. Luckily, the umpire like allowed him to you know get get his tip of the cap and everything like that. But you know, he's yeah. another example too where you know I I talked to him you know last week or so and he, and he was talking about how you know obviously that that mindset that you have and you brought it up earlier of you know wanting to get to the majors in a certain amount of time and you start to put pressure on yourself to get there without really any control you know you, yeah. you you're not the one who makes the call and and so you know i, I i've dealt with this a little bit myself and i know you know other people around me have have as well is you know trying to rush to get to your goals and you know forgetting it's about the journey not the destination yeah. Yeah. I think when we're, when we're young, we're praised for our potential, but like when you're older, you're praised for your results, you know? And, and, and so like, it's easy to see the potential, right? Like the pedigreed person, um, you know, I, I went to Stanford, I was first overall pick, yada, yada, yada. Everyone says, oh, Mark, you're going to have a great life. You're You got all this potential, right? Um, but sometimes potential can be, it's like a blessing for sure, but it can also be a curse because now you've raised the bar as far as what everyone expects of you, mm -hmm. you know? And so the more you're actually able to get outside of your ego, right? Whether it's an overinflated ego or an underinflated ego feeling like, oh, I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know if anyone's going to give me the time of day. I don't know if whatever it is, right? Um, and, and the more you're able to just be present in the moment where you just kind of tune all that out and you say, I'm going to go do this because it's worth doing to the best of my ability. And I'm going to, I'm going to try to, you know, have the results that I want to have, you know, it's like, no one talks about the guy who, you know, no one would have said had potential. Maybe he believes he had potential in himself, but no one, saw that potential and acknowledged it and then had the same career as me. Right. You know, like that's not a story. Right. The story is, Oh, Mark had a crazy amount of potential and never lived up to it, you know, but he kept going and, you know, eventually made his debut. Um, and so, yeah, you know, it's funny you brought up Drew Maggi, like we played together last year. Um, and so, yeah, he was, he was in Lehigh Valley with, with us, um, with the Phillies AAA. And so like, we, uh, yeah, we got to know each other really well, um, became really good friends. And so I was, I was so jazzed for him when he got to make his debut this year. It was, it was awesome. 
And I think the phrase that you said of just keep going, he, you know, he, he echoed that multiple times when I spoke with him. And, you know, I think especially for both of your guys' journeys, that is one thing that can motivate and inspire anybody that, you know, how, how doesn't matter how many times you're thrown down. doesn't matter how many times you feel like you're not good enough. Uh, I, I, I feel like it's just so important just to get up, keep going and, you know, trying to better yourself each and every single day. And I, I also think as well, you know, with that, you know, phrase of maybe not feeling good enough. I feel like a lot of people, especially if, you know, it is their job or it is their career and they're not getting that validation from that specific aspect of their life, they allow it to make them feel like that in their entire life. And so I'm I'm curious for you, how have you not allowed maybe that feeling of not feeling good enough in baseball to, you know, make, make yourself not feel good enough? Yeah. Um, it, it, it comes down to what I think is, you know, one of the most important things that we can figure out is our identity. It's like, how, how do we define who we are, like where we derive our worth? You know, I was actually talking with uh, a college kid last night, uh, believe it or not. And we were just talking about, you know, he, he's coming back from these injuries and he's trying to figure out how to, how to enjoy playing baseball and try to get back on the field and have success and do all the things that he really wants to do with baseball. And, uh, you know, I just remarked that it's like at, at when we all started, this is the story arc of every single baseball player. It's like we start with joy of just playing the game, being in the sun, playing with your friends. Like we don't care about the results. We, we, it's just fun to be outside. It's fun to, you know, throw a baseball, hit a baseball, field a baseball, all those things. And at a certain point, for those of us that have played longer and longer and longer, it's like we've had success. When we have success, we get more opportunities. and if we have success in those opportunities, we get, you know, you go up to the next level, next level, next level. And before you know it, you're, you're playing pro ball. And what what's happened is that you've connected the joy of playing the game with your success. So, uh, and it, it's completely rewired how you view baseball and where you actually define who you are and, and what, you, where you derive your self-worth from, because we all want to experience joy, Right. And, and, and so now what happens is that our success is the precursor for our joy. So we have to have success in order to experience joy. And so when we get hurt, when we fail, when we go through the slumps, when we have all of the issues that many of us have that I've, I've definitely had in my life, it's like the joy is sucked away. And I got to a point in, at the end of 2017 where I had been basically perpetually injured. I hadn't had a successful year in quite a while. Um, and I, I was just like burnt out and I needed a break. And, and so I stopped playing baseball. And in 2018, I, you know, I didn't pick up a baseball and I thought I was done. Um, and then maybe a year later I decided to have surgery cause I, I was still hurt. So I needed to have surgery and start that rehab process. But in that time, something changed. And what changed was I got to re like revisit baseball. The idea of like, who is Mark when it comes to baseball as baseball is not where I'm going to derive any of my self-worth and I'm actually going to do it because I enjoy it. And these are the things that I enjoy about it. I actually enjoy the competition. I enjoy standing on a mound, getting a, getting the call from the catcher and throwing a pitch, trying to get a guy out. Like there's just a, a, an amount of joy that I get from doing that in the same way that other people love running or other people love whatever it is going to movies. It's like, I just get joy from that, you know? And so that was one thing. And then the joy of the relationships of getting to try to win a championship as a team, there's something special about being part of a team. And so, so joy then became the, like the source where everything else flowed from, as opposed to like success being the source in which everything else flows from, because sometimes success doesn't happen, you know? And and what I believe is that actually, if we make joy, the source of where everything else flows from, then success will be kind of down river of, of where that, that spark, that initial, you know, source of joy, um, starts. And, and, and I got to experience that in, in, you know, in 21 and in 2022, when I, you know, finally made, made it to the major leagues, it's like joy was the thing that kept me going. And it, it also prevented me from like really beating myself up when I wasn't playing well. I was like, ah, whatever. It's like, I don't care about that. I, I just get to show up and I get to be part of this team and I get to throw, I get to hold a baseball. I get to put on a Jersey. I get to stand on the mound. It's like, these are, these are gifts. These are things that I'm not entitled to. And that, that changes everything. 
Um, and I actually think a lot of guys, like we, we don't realize that this joy that we had when we were a kid has now some somehow morphed into this like joy that we can only experience when we're having success because we've had so much success and it's just become interrelated that it's like joy and success are the same and then success leaves. And so joy leaves, but it's like, you don't like, it's a choice. Like you can actually wake up and say, I'm going to pick up this baseball and play catch and I'm just going to have so much fun and I'm going to enjoy every bit of it, you know? And, and like a guy like Maggi, Drew Maggi, like is like that, you know, he's just a grinder. He loves being there and, and that joy ultimately, you know, like it's, it's contagious. And, and he, he got to experience like what he got to experience in Pit, Pittsburgh earlier this year was phenomenal. And, and like the whole team was better off for it. You know, there was a, there, it was just a spark. And even though, you know, he only had a couple at bats and, you know, got his hit and all that stuff. It was just, it was just the whole city, the whole country was fired up for him. It was like, it's, it's a pretty powerful thing. It is very powerful. I, th- I think that perspective is really powerful too. Not only if you're a baseball player, but if you're, if you're just living, you know, I, I think with any job, uh, you know, we, we tie a lot of our success to our joy that we get out of that job. And we, we forget why we, why we even loved that job, you know, and, and you know, then we start to beat ourselves up. Kind of like you mentioned, I, I, I feel like, especially for the younger guys, that's so beneficial uh, because you, you forget, um, you know, the carelessness that you may have had in little league or, uh, you know, middle school ball or something like that. And, um, you, you know, what, one thing, you know, you mentioned in, uh, in, in the June Lee, uh, our article, when, when you were speaking about, you know, yeah. stepping away that I thought was really cool. As you said, uh, uh, that was the expectation and the goal. God, God does things for reasons we sometimes can't understand and we won't understand for years down the road or maybe never in this lifetime. And I'm yeah. curious for you, Reflecting on your first 10 years in professional baseball, you know, what really comes to mind? Yeah. I mean, w- when it comes to that, like, so I, I think there's always lessons to be learned in a lot of the things that we experience, um, you know, getting, getting to get called up last year, I think closed a lot of loops that were left open, you know, that I was like, you know, and, and I was sincere about that. It's like, I actually had peace in my career. If I never made it to the big leagues and I never understood what it was all for or anything like that, it's like, I was fine with that, honestly. And, um, and like, I don't think we always need answers. Um, and, you know, faith is huge for me, but, but like really how I understand it, it's like, I don't think we need answers. I, I think we need the presence of God. And like, I think we need, it's like, what, 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 makes more sense. It's like, um, like, would you rather have facts about your, you know, your condition, say you have a disease and the doctor comes in and he says, Hey, um, this is what's going on, you know, good luck. Or he comes in and he says, this is what's going on. And I'm with you. Like, we're going to, we're going to get through it together. And even if I can't heal you in the way that you, you, we all want you to be healed. It's like, it's going to be okay. Like, Mm -hmm. And, and and so there's there's just like this this understanding of like you know we want answers but I don't think we need answers I think we need relationship I think we need to know that like we're not alone to know that like we're comforted you know um, that like we're we're seen and we're known in the depths of the you know struggles that we're going through and that that's okay you know um, and, and that's just how I see it you know I think a lot of people would probably either have a lot of questions or say, Mark, like you are crazy for, <laughs> for saying that. But, but I, I mean, I, I firmly believe that that's true that um, like facts don't change us, you know, right. like experience does. It's like, if we experience, um, you know, if we experience a relationship, like you can know everything about your wife, like all the facts you can read her wiki page, you know, <laughs> but it's different than actually, holding her hand and going on a walk or sitting across the table from her, you know? And I I think, I think it's the same with God. And I know God's like weird to, you know, talk about and sometimes hard to approach and all this stuff. But um, I just think, I just think that like when we, when we meet God, as he presents himself, um, like we get to experience something that will actually help us get through whatever we're going through, as opposed to just like having the facts about, 
where we are and what's going on. And, you know, it's like I, the facts oftentimes aren't compelling to me, you know, <laughs> but relationships always are. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a very analytical thinker and, you know, things need to make sense. And a lot yeah. of times I need to take a step back and allow things to materialize so they don't make sense down the line. And, you know, I always say to myself, everything happens for a reason. And it's tough in some of those moments when you say that to yourself to fully believe it all the time. And then, you know, when you have that moment where, where you're sort of referring to, of you know, wh when you see it all come together, or where, where you see the the greater purpose or the greater journey all come together, that that moment is pretty gratifying of that's that's why I just believe. Yeah. Yeah. It, like I, I think about it from, you know, like a college perspective. It's like you you take a science class, like you have the lecture and then you have the lab. I think from the enlightenment on, it's like we've really valued just in a, like intellectualism and knowledge and understanding about how things work. Um, and we've almost like ignored some of the lab based stuff, you know, we're like, Hey, I like, let me, let me read like, uh, you know, books on suffering are written all the time, right? It's like, let me read about this. Uh, you know, let me read about suffering or let me read about anxiety. Let me read about these things. Because I think if I can understand it, then it'll, I can actually avoid it in some way, especially these negative emotions. So it's like, the more I understand it, the more I'm just going to avoid it. And I can actually like strategically use techniques to to avoid these negative feelings that we have or whatever it is. And so we, we like understand it all in theory, but then we go to the lab and we're like, I'm supposed to, you know, it's like a chemistry lab. It's like, I'm supposed to put this much compound, you know, and put these two things together and it's supposed to do this, but it's not doing that. Why? Like, why is it not doing what it's supposed to be doing? And then that's where you learn because you're like, oh, these other factors that I never even considered that weren't talked about in the lecture like these were actually, it was designed for me to experience this and learn it firsthand, like as I'm touching these things and I'm, you know, going through this and, and, you know, we don't look at a lab as like, and like failure, you know, if, if it doesn't go perfectly, how we theorize from the lectures, it's like, we don't look at that as failure. We look at that as learning. That's actually what learning is. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes it's uncomfortable. It's like, I love, I would love to just you know, get straight A's and ace every lab and ace every exam that life throws at me. But that's not <laughs> what happens. Um, like no one gets to experience that. And so I, I just think a lot of life is, is, is lab and not really the lecture. And we love lectures. We love the knowledge. We love reading books. We love, you know, increasing our understanding of things. Um, but we never actually, you know, it's like, would you rather read about the Grand Canyon and see all the most beautiful pictures of the Grand Canyon? Or do you want to st like stand on the South Rim and just experience the awe and wonder of this like unbelievable, you know, natural phenomenon, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, I think you'll probably learn more standing on the South Rim than reading about it. And it, because there's an experience that you get when you are, you know, <laughs> face to face with something that like you can't really put words to, and no one can really put words to, you know, I'm, I'm afraid of heights. So if I went up on the edge, I, <laughs> I, would, be, I would learn a lot about myself and my fear of heights. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Well, you know, also I, I know in 2018, you know, during that time off of, of, off of baseball, you mentioned, you know, being able to find your identity, you know, outside of the game. And, and I'm curious for you, you know, outside of baseball, what are some things like, what are some of your passions outside of the game of, of how you want to continue your post-career life? Yeah. I, I, relationships are single-handedly the most important thing for me. Um, and that's always been true. I, I think it took going through everything that I went through to, for, to really become solidified. Um, but like relationship with my family and friends and and even my teammates, like I, I really miss those relationships. And that was part of the reason why I wanted to play again. Um, you know, and so I, I really think something where I can be relational will be like part of my future. Um, you know, I, I want to, you know, help people with whatever gifts that I've been given and whatever wisdom that I've earned over the years. Um, you know, and, you know, I, I'm also like curious about a lot of things. I feel like I'm a little entrepreneurial 
Uh, so, you know, I could probably get myself into some trouble with that, <laughs> but you know, I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm trying to just be okay with, you know, I feel like I have a pretty high risk tolerance. It's like, I'm okay with failure. I've been through a lot of failure, you know, and, and actually turned out okay. And I'm like, you know what, maybe it, it it's not fun to go through, but it's like, I, I'm, I, I have a resiliency and like thicker skin because of it. And I'm like, you know what, I'm okay. Taking some punches every now and then it's like, but I want to do something that, that actually is helpful to other people. And, um, you know, is, is kind of hopefully in line with how God's wired me and my personality, my characteristics, the gifts that he's given me. So I don't know exactly what that is. Um, still figuring it out, but you know, hopefully it's not something I have to figure out for, for at least a few more years. I hope so too, man. And I, yeah. I can't wait to see you back on the field and, you know, anything that you do, whether it's on the field or off the field, I'll always be here to support you. And uh, I also heard as well in, in the wake and rake interview that you did that, that you're a big writer as well. So I hope potentially we'll see a uh, Mark Appel book at some point. Yeah. Yeah. People have told me like, Hey, you should, you should write a book. Uh, I was like, oh, yeah, that feels I'd like a it. big thing. Um, but yeah, maybe, maybe at some point, um, you know, that, that could be in my future. I don't know, but I, writing has been, has been really fun. And it's been a great way for me to express myself in a different way than I can when I'm throwing a baseball. <laughs> so I love it, man. Really yeah. appreciate you taking the time, all the insight. And, um, I know people who are watching this, whether they knew your journey before or, or do now, uh, they're definitely going to be inspired after listening to this. I, I appreciate it, Jake. Thanks so much. I hope that you did enjoy my conversation with Mark Appel and got a little bit more insight on what he learned about his experiences with all the pressure that he had after being drafted first overall by the Astros and how he was able to find his identity outside of the game of baseball. And I think that you could use this in your regular life if you're an athlete or if you're just a person like I am who works a regular job. Finding your identity outside of what you do for work is so important and really being able to find hobbies outside of that to really be able to help you disconnect on a daily basis and not feel like you're working all the time. You know, for for me, working in sports, that's kind of difficult because I love sports so much and really it's tough to disconnect and, and not be around it all the time. But I found how beneficial that is to not only have a work life balance, but also to be able to have an identity outside of what you do and really finding who you are outside of what you do, because so much of our identity sometimes is tied to what we do for work or what people know us by, you know, what we do for a job and everything like that. And, you know, athletes feel the exact same way. And so I think it's just so important to be able to find those few things outside of what you do for work that really make you find ways to disconnect and fill you up with joy. You know, one thing that I love to do is go out and hike and you know, be out in nature, ski as well, uh, to really be able to help me disconnect from the outside world and all the external factors. Because it's so easy with all that stuff to get overwhelmed, to get anxiety, to feel that pressure that the world can put down on you. And, you know, I hope that you were able to take something from this episode that you're able to apply to your own life that's able to help you ease that anxiety and ease that, that stress from those external factors. Because that's honestly one of the biggest reasons why I love doing this podcast, being able to share stories just like Mark's that really be able to help you not only get a lens into his experiences, but you're able to use what he learned and apply it to your own life to help you ultimately be better and live each day a little bit happier. But if you want to hear episodes just like this one, make sure to go over to YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. Everything is posted on Spotify, Apple, Google Podcasts, Outcast. You can also follow Iggy Sports Talk over on, on Instagram for updates about the podcast and also clips from some of the past episodes as well. But as always, I greatly appreciate everybody tuning in. I hope that you have a great rest of your week. And remember, you're enough, you're loved, and at the end of the day, nothing matters. We're just on a spinning rock in space. So just try and do your best to live each and every single day to the fullest. And remember, we only get every second once. So make sure to make it count. I really appreciate you tuning in. I'll talk to you next time.